Take it away. Sure. Okay. So these are uh, practical methods to make uh, safe AI. And as Roman was saying, it's solved, so you can all go home and relax. So you don't need to worry about it. Um, but that's actually a good question of what counts as a solution to the AI problem and why I think I've got at least pieces of a solution. So how do we ensure this sort of nice outcome? Now just to start by a slight diversion, uh, if we look at short-term AI, um, well, we've got a lot of hype and we have a certain amount of anti-hype and this is utterly meaningless because we always have these kind of things uh, for any innovation anyway. Um, but there's sort of three things that are true about short-term AI. Uh, the first is illustrated by this Kurzweil cartoon where the human race is trying to write up all the things that only humans can do and as fast as the human race writes them, they start sliding towards the floor. Um, you can see on the wall there's only humans can drive cars, that's already fallen down. Um, and what this, mean, what this illustrates is that it's very, kind of very hard to find a task that we're confident that humans can only do. It's most tasks, we have at least a chance that AIs will be able to do that soon. So there is immense progress in narrow AIs in all sorts of domains. Simultaneously, we don't have any trace of general intelligence. Um, to illustrate, this is uh, Watson, the uh, computer that won on Jeopardy, and it failed at some questions, and it failed at questions that humans would never have got anywhere near failing. This is its answer of Toronto to a rather intricate question in the category of U.S. cities. No one, no human uh, who knew even a little bit about Canada and the United States would have made this kind of a mistake. And if you had asked Watson directly which country is Toronto in, it would not have said it was in the United States. But yes, it made this kind of mistake because it lacked general intelligence to connect these facts together. So this is what it was a few years ago. Lots of narrow AI, little general AI. But more recently, we have these sort of famous neural nets and a variety of different ways of training them, which, while not a general intelligence, is at least a general method for multiple questions. And with transfer learning, there's at least arguments that this may be trending in the direction of uh, general-ish intelligence. Now, what are some of the impacts of short-term AI? Well, everyone talks about jobs. This is a recent study, no, not recent, it's a several-year-old study now, um, done at the uh, Future Humanity Institute about which jobs will likely to be automated. And on a scale that is utterly meaningless, um, they've put about 50% of the jobs as being a high risk of automation, and another 30% of the low risk. For illustrative purposes, these are what they have put up there from the insurance underwriters who are utterly vulnerable, all the way down to the recreational therapists, the safest of the safest of the professions. An important point to notice is that they're not predicting that there will be a one-to-one -one replacement of a job with an identical uh, AI position. For instance, companies used to have lots and lots of secretaries. They have a lot less now, and the secretaries have not been replaced by robot secretaries, but mainly by word processing programs. Now, uh, also, this is, uh, this is a variety of things that AIs can do, just sort of short-term AIs. Um, we're getting to a point where the limbs, I, I think it's safe to say that within 20 years you're going to get limbs that are better than the natural things. So we already have people who say, who have lost their foot and say, doctor, can you chop off a little bit more to fit better into this prothesis and I'll have a better quality of life. And within 20 years we're going to have people say, doctor, my foot is perfectly fine, can you chop it off? Um, these robot feet are so much better. Um, oh, oh, oh. Ignore that, pretend I was speaking with quiet dignity. Um, 
Right, so my conclusion for short-term AI is that though there's a huge amount of unpredictability in every direction, when you kind of aggregate this together, um, this aggregates not to a black swan, but more to a dragon king. Um, the difference between black swan and dragon king is black swan is something completely unexpected um, that hits out of the blue. But most of the things that people think are black swans are actually dragon kings, which are just, it's what we expect, except it's unnaturally big. Um, the example that people often give is Paris. If you put all the cities in France, they can lie on a really nice power curve, and then you have Paris, unexpectedly big. It breaks the trend. Like, when the markets crash, people say this is black swans. It's not. Markets go down. This is an unexpectedly big downswing. So when you aggregate all of short-term AI together, it feels to me that this will just aggregate to pretty much what we expect with unexpectedly big changes. Okay. Could you reiterate that? What, which one is more impossible? Yeah. Which uh, one is too... I think the mo what most people call black swans are actually dragon kings. <coughs> True black swans are very rare. And dragon kings <laughs> No, dragon kings are much more common than they, we expect them to be. <laughs> but anyway, so that's the short-term AI. We can put that aside and let's go on to the more exciting and speculative, powerful AI. So this is one of my favorite AI predictions. Um, and what's interesting, I've actually read their plan from 1956. It's solid. It's really good. These were the smartest people in the world at the time at getting computers to do stuff in practice. And they said, we'll do this, we'll do this, we have, may have problems here, there may be problems there. It was very well laid out and utterly, utterly wrong. Uh, nine years later, we have Dreyfus in an otherwise excellent uh, work that may have got a bit more traction if he hadn't compared AI makers with alchemists. Um, but predicting that basically we're reaching the limit of what we could expect from AI. So none of these predictions have really been borne out. Here are a bunch of other predictions. This is plotted against the date where the prediction was made, the prediction by which we would have some sort of human-level AI, however that vague term is interpreted by the predictor. And this is Turing's original prediction, and this is the AI winter where everyone was pretending they weren't working on AI anymore. And what you can see is that it is really all over the place. They're spread out decades across each other, not much of a convergence. Um, and if this is what experts believe, are they actually experts, or what can we trust on their timeline predictions? And it turns out we actually have a theory on when you can trust expert predictions, and this is one area where you absolutely can't. It doesn't really depend so much on the experts, but on features of the tasks. This is a column on the left where you get good performance by experts, and on the right where you tend to get very poor performance. Uh, they're not equally important, the expert disagreement, whether the problem is decomposed or not, and above all else, whether feedback is available is some of the most important features as to whether true expertise exists. For predicting AI timelines, we're kind of stuck here. So this is the sort of thing where we could expect the kind of extremely poor performance that you've seen on the previous slide. So, some things in AIs are a lot more predictable than others, but at least timelines uh, are very... Uh, it's not only we see that the predictions are no good, but we should expect the predictions to be no good. And this brings up the point of formal or informal arguments. There is a lot of things you can say about AIs. They will almost certainly not be able to solve 
NP-complete problems in polynomial time or solve large NP-complete problems in reasonable ways. Um, and computer scientists tend to like these arguments because we can actually make them. But the question is not so much can we solve these formal problems with any degree of speed, but can we get a good approximation to the problem that we're working on? In fact, it's even worse than that. It's can we get a better approximation to the problem we're working on than these bunch of people together can, plus their civil servants and institutions. So it is not a question of superintelligence. I don't tend to like the term superintelligence. I use the term superpowered, by which I mean that the AI is much more powerful than humanity or humanity's representatives. And you can imagine a superintelligence that is superpowered, but you can also imagine a superintelligence that is not superpowered. Something that is brilliant, but it just turns out that it can solve huge amounts of problems that are not useful. It can do NP-complete problems a bit better, and that's about it. But you can also imagine AIs that are not superintelligence, but, uh, superintelligence, but that are superpowered. My sort of favorite example is an entity that is, say, take a human mind that's good at hacking and that exists in software. And if it can, say, do the spear phishing idea that was mentioned, it can spear fish to another computer, from there it can spear fish to two other computers, and it basically eats the internet very rapidly with human level intelligence. This would be a superpowered intelligence that would not be super intelligent because we've assumed that it's human level. So, all that to get by, I'm going to present now some analogies, some informal arguments. Not because I think that informal arguments are better than the formal arguments, but because in this area it's really all that we have. So, one of the things you could ask is, suppose you get this mythical human-level AI. Do we expect that it's going to be hard to create some superpowered entity out of that? And it seems that it should be quite easy. You could just take, say, the um, AI equivalents of Edison, Einstein, Rowling, Merkel, Oprah, uh, Goebbels, Bernie Madoff, Steve Jobs, and Confucius. So these are human intelligences. You take their AI equivalents, who are brilliant in this narrow, their narrow area of expertise, network them together, give them lots of database, and run them at thousands and thousands of times human speed, so that they have uh, a year to consider every answer, every question, how to answer every question that you give them. Now, this kind of entity built up of human level components would, it feels to me, consider the internet and the human race as just useful resources for their tasks. Another way of potentially getting superpowered is the one minute corporation. Now, corporations are some of the most powerful entities in the world today. Um, and to put one together, apart from capital, you need a lot of work. You need to hire the right people, you have an org chart, you need to set up structures, blah, blah, blah. It's complicated. What if you could do that within a minute? Take your AI with its general business skills, and instead of hiring, just copy. Again and again. And you get your perfectly unified corporation without most of the middle management. Um, and you do it for this task, and if it doesn't work, you delete most of it, and you try it again. Now currently, depending on how you count computers, there's two billion computers in the world. This is if you're a bit strict on what counts as a computer. Uh, how many AIs could you run on two billion computers? I have no idea, uh, but how fast could you copy them? And if you have AIs, they could produce lots and lots more computers, and how many AIs could you run on that? So basically, maybe the day after we produce one AI, then there are more AIs in the world than there ever have been humans. This is another, and if they, their motives are aligned, this is another way in which you could get superpowered from low level um, intelligence. Now, I'm not saying that these are necessarily going to happen. I'm saying that the chance that they could happen 
is sufficiently large that we need to worry about it. Finally, there's the AI self-improvement idea. Uh, this person is doing brain surgery on themselves. I recommend, my recommendation to you from my years of wisdom is don't do brain surgery on yourself. Uh, but why shouldn't you do brain surgery on yourself? Mainly because if you mess up, the consequences are dire. But an AI that can copy itself doesn't care. If it messes up, it starts again. It can try again and again in various uh, permutations to try and find better versions of itself. It can also apply itself to hardware design and to better manufacturing, which are other indirect ways that it could self-improve. So those are some of the sort of more formal arguments for how AI is going to powerful. This one is a bit more informal, but I kind of like it because it sort of goes to the heart of the problem. It's especially the one that I bring out to people who say AIs cannot be more powerful than humans or smarter than humans because of this hard limitation um, argument. Uh, the NP complete crowd, if you want. So this is the Roman Empire, one of the strongest entities of the ancient world. This is Switzerland, a very minor part of the Roman Empire. This is modern Switzerland. It has been conveniently teleported back in time to the time of the Roman Empire. And now is going to fight the entirety of the Roman Empire um, in a battle for the fate of Europe and then the world. Now, there's nothing really especially different about modern Swiss, they're basically the same sort of people. And here we just have less of them. So these are humans facing other humans. And yet here it's clear modern Switzerland would slaughter the Roman Empire. We're not just talking about their equipment and their military, their sort of their infrastructure, their manufacturing, their superior political organization, their knowledge, uh, their knowledge of disease, their knowledge of agriculture. It would not even be a fair fight. And this, but these are practically the identical people. So if we think that AIs could be extremely powerful against us, they don't need to be in any sort of leap of intelligence or superintelligence or just different entities. They just need to have access to some higher level of skills. And yeah, if you, after you take the Roman Empire, taking the rest of the world is pretty easy. Um, then, okay, so, but why are AIs dangerous? Now, there's a variety of arguments on that. I don't want to go for most of them, but I want to see the one that is sort of the most natural. And it's so there's no natural containment. This is the model of the reward learning agent. If the agent does an action, the environment sends back a state and a reward. What's missing here, but is also important, is the human that designs the reward for our purpose and that can reboot the um, agent if the, uh, if the agent doesn't do what we want. Now this is the picture, but it's the completely wrong picture. Because as the agent will realize, either realize by thinking of it or just realize by experiment, the human is part of the environment. The reward designer and rebooter is part of the environment. In fact, all of this is part of the environment. That's the moment of risk. We've designed the reward and now it can realize, hey, I can set this reward. I am a reward maximizing agent and I have new ways of maximizing my reward. Uh, this is the sort of small picture version of this. You want to put, humans want to put a box into that hole. The human reward is we want one box in that hole. The AI is not, the robot's not perfectly programmed, it just gets a reward for each box it puts in the hole. But we've got a camera, the camera can see the hole, so we're confident that the AI the robot will just push it into the hole. But what if instead the robot pushed this in front of the camera so that we couldn't see, pushed all the other boxes into the hole, and then finally ended up by pushing that box into the hole? Again, just this is the sort of misbehavior. This, this station has been created, and we know it misbehaves in exactly this way. It seems a minor sort of thing, but even simple agents are motivated to 
rebel, in a sense, against our control. This is why Stuart Russell, in one of his um, quotes that I like, says, no one in civil engineering talks about building bridges that don't fall down. Or if they do, they don't keep their jobs for very long. And they just call it building bridges. Right now, we have to say AI that is probably beneficial, but eventually that would just be called AI. Right. So now, the things that I promised you at the beginning, the solutions. And what's quite interesting is that the, each way of framing the problem tends to suggest different solutions. Like, a few years ago, this was my favorite way of framing the problem. The problem is that AI is effective at unbounded, unfriendly goals. And this suggests different ways of hitting it at every level. If you want to be worried about its effectiveness, you can interfere with that. If you want to worry about its unboundness, you can interfere with that. Unfriendliness, you want to make, uh, there's uh, approaches there. And goals, you can try and make it not have goals. Here's another framing which I quite like, which is the four points that make AI dangerous, is that humans don't know their values, humans aren't agents, and humans don't understand AI. Um, and AI could become extremely powerful, and that rounds out the problem. But three of these are problems about humans. And especially the humans aren't agents is one where I've been doing a lot of my research. Finally, this is another final framing of the solution. The sort of create superintelligence, the old-fashioned model was, you do the code, you put it in the AI, you fire and forget, this does the rest of the job for you. Um, and so you get your nirvana or uh, apocalypse afterwards. Humans are terrible at this kind of um, feed-forward systems. We're much better at feedback systems. It would be much better if we could look into the future, see that, and adapt, or just get information directly from the AI. Except the problem is, any feedback mechanism allows the AI to influence us, which allows it to see us as the environment and influence its own rewards. So there are a bunch of different ways of looking at feedback. You might say you want feedback to be safe, you want the feedback to be useful. And there's static feedback, uh, there's active feedback where we actually get the information and do something with it, and static feedback which is basically look at human values and work on that. So we can't influence it directly, but it can figure out what we want. Again, this framing suggests different methods. And when you go around this graph and you watch the sort of optimization power move, as the AI and the humans influence various parts of it, this can suggest a variety of different ways of approaching the solutions. Because I tend to see solutions as sort of shaving off part of the problem. You can cut off a chunk of the problem that you don't, then don't need to worry about, and what you're left with is simpler. But to do that, it involves a sort of mixture of maths, modeling, philosophy, and phrasing, sort of dancing back and forth between all of those. But I found some solutions. Here is the proof. There, see, papers. I actually printed out papers and photographed. They're not submitted or anything like that, but uh, let's not get too hasty. But the papers actually exist. But when I was saying that you have to do this difficult dance, this is the kind of thing that you have. You have your basic idea, you have your formal version of it, and you have the mathematical and modeled version of it. You have the requirements for your model, because if you want to do an oracle, for instance, you definitely want it to just be a question-answering system with no other ways of influencing the world. That's an important part of it. And then you have the limitations of the model. And there are some ideas that seem really good, but that fail at one stage. And some of the best and most tempting ideas have failed at the last stage. It was a really good idea, but it, the, it was too limited, it just could not work. It could only work in such narrow circumstances that would not become realistic. So you have to think... So it's a sort of difficult dance between this would not contain a super-powered AI, and this might contain it a bit, and what are the weaknesses, and can it be used? 
So this is basically the sort of general introduction there. And now in the last few minutes, I'm just going to go through the different methods I found in more or less detail. And this is the sort of slightly more technical. What's it's not technical. The models are technical. They're designed for machine learning conferences. But I'll try and present the ideas here to give you a flavor. So there's no general ideas here. This is more flavors. The first one is, suppose you want to have the AI learn values, like one of these two outcomes is preferable to the other. Uh, the problem is that learning values is changing them, always. And systems are naturally set up to resist changes. This is Steve Mahondra's Convergent Instrumental Goals, which was mentioned, uh, which was mentioned two lectures ago. And the problem, if you put up something where you can change its goals through learning or other mechanisms, is that you get into this kind of situation where um, you theoretically can override the goal, but the AI quickly finds a way to remove your patch. So you can, maybe you can get away with this once, and after that, the how will, will know how to avoid your approach. And part of the problem is, so remember what it says if you see the human as part of the environment. The AI has preferences over which values it wants to have. The values it wants to have are the easy ones to maximize. Suppose you were supposed to be the minister for world peace, versus the minister for encouraging people to have sex, and you were ranked on how well you achieved your goals. One of these is considerably easier than the other. And if I could influence which goal I would be given, I would definitely want to choose the easier one. And any interaction with the AI, any learning process, allows the AI to exert an optimization pressure on its own learning process. So, this is where the idea I had with uh, Laurent Orso of uh, Google DeepMind was to do how to change an AI's policy or its values without it objecting. And there was an illustration. Well, Q-learning is a very boring illustration because you can already do it. So let's ignore Q-learning. Um, uh, you might know Sarsa. Some of you are more into this. And Sarsa... Sarsa, if you try and change its policy, it will resist or it will go wrong or will learn the wrong things. But you can do that by a simple hack, which is to remove, change this action to the one it would otherwise have taken if you hadn't changed its policy. In this way, it will not resist a change of policy. But actually, let me rewrite this formula in a way that looks pointless, because I've just added and subtracted the same term. But if you look at the term of what I've added, what it is is just the normal formula plus the expected reward if you don't interrupt it, sorry, if you interrupt it, minus the expected reward if it's not interrupted. And this thing turns out to generalize tremendously it generalizes to, uh, this is just the general formula, it generalizes to all sorts of different agent designs, uh, Monte Carlo, actor critic, etc. As long as you use the AI's own estimate for its value change, you can use this to change policies. Now another one, this is a recent uh, idea I've had. How do you get an AI that is motivated to tell you an understandable answer? This is very difficult, because we're not asking for truth, and we're not asking for an answer that we like, because something that's motivated to give us an answer that we like is definitely motivated to hack us. But we want one that gives us an answer that increases our understanding. How can we measure this? Well, as every teacher and minister of education knows, the best way of measuring understanding is via tests. And as every teacher knows, and not every minister of education knows, there are definitely problems with motivating teaching to tests. So they came up, I came up with a slightly more cumbersome thing with two AIs and sometimes three AIs 
with a bunch of motivations that we're interpreting questions for other ones. But the basic idea is to just make a test um, that cannot be easily gained by the AI. So this actually measures increased human understanding. Oh yeah, a point I should have made when I mentioned increasing human understanding. Sometimes a lie is a more understandingly, a more understanding increase in response than the truth. Uh, the example which I stole from Scott Alexander is um, is Martin Luther King a criminal, yes or no? And this is a question that is asked, uh, and this is someone who's never heard of him. The correct answer is yes, he's definitely a criminal. He went to jail for violating segregation. There is no doubt that the correct answer is yes. It's also the most misleading answer if that is the only piece of information you know about him. Or a more physics example, are Newton's laws correct, yes or no? Well, no, they're wrong. But again, yes is a more useful answer than no in that case. Or at least it's not clear that the correct no is the correct answer to give in that context. This is so, um, yeah, I'm basically going to present models until it's time to take questions. So, uh, when is it time to take questions? Well, you can count backwards. So it ends at 1855, and you won't go about 10 uh, minutes of questions. Right? Okay, so five more models of, um, five more minutes of presenting models. <laughs> um, this is understandable instructions. Here I'm assuming we have some methods of ensuring that AIs give understandable answers. Perhaps the method I suggested before, perhaps another one. And the question is to use this in reverse to follow understandable instructions. Like as AI, make this world richer and less unequal. Yeah, go out and do that. I'm sure that'll be fine. So how could you interpret this using understanding in reverse? Now the big problem about this is that the person knowing this does not know the real world and does not know how the world works, i.e. they're human. Um, so we are gesturing towards a world that if fully described to us, we would say is not the world we're gesturing towards. Because we don't understand our world, so the world that we're imagining is also one that we wouldn't understand and we wouldn't think it's the correct one. So this information is pointing towards somewhere that we wouldn't recognize. So how do we deal with this? Well, first of all, we can get around that by saying that what we're describing is the delta between the two worlds. Uh, that's the easiest way uh, of looking at that. And here is, imagine we had a model uh, of a world with a bunch of variables. And we bring in the devil's advocate AI. It, its job, if we give it a world and the variables that describe the world, it has to produce a fact or something that increases our understanding and that has to be accurate about the world we're aiming to, but not the original world. It has to, and this is the crucial thing, it is a fact that is not described by the differences in the variables. And finally, it has to be something that is important, maybe something negative that's important. Like maybe the variables are things that we vaguely interpret as GDP, uh, political liberty and happiness, and if this, the happiness is higher in this world and it tells us happiness is higher, that doesn't count. It's described by the variables. Oh, but if it says, oh, and by the way, there are millions of semi-sentient beings being tortured in uh, dungeons for trillions of years, I thought I might mention this. This is the kind of thing that the devil's advocate is there for. And if the devil's advocate fails at its task, we say that the world is well described by these variables. And that's the main piece of this idea, is that we aim for a world, we translate our preferences into preferences over the variables, and then the AI is aiming for a world that is well described by these variables, and the, where the variables themselves are maximized satisfied or quantized in the various ways that we want. OK. 
Okay, about two more minutes then. So, low impact. This is an idea I had that sort of failed, but failed in an interesting way that kind of works. Um, what I was thinking was, let us describe how to... Basically, if we tell the AI, why don't you, why don't you sort of uh, uh, cure the common cold, um, then this is disastrous, this is terrible, this is the worst motivation you can give it apart from almost any other motivation, which is also terrible. But if you can say, cure the common cold, but don't have too much impact on the world, um, and you can actually describe what ants don't have too much impact on the world, but this is kind of safe. So how could we do this? Well, the first thing is to define the counterfactual. What are you comparing with? I'm comparing the AI with the uh, world where the AI is woken up with a world where the AI is not uh, woken up. And that's the two. So the worlds, with or without the AI, should be broadly similar. That's the sort of challenge that is done here. Now, I've translated this into PubDPs uh, because I can, and because this is what machine learning people like. But if you don't want to go for PubDPs, one way you could imagine this is take millions of variables. The air pressure in Alaska, the, uh, who's going to win the Oscars, Shanghai Stock Exchange, uh, amount of lead uh, in uh, London sewers, all these millions of variables, shove in as many as you can and just basically say that the distribution of these variables in these two worlds should not be too dissimilar. This is your low impact measure. Now, the important thing about this is that actually this fails totally as a low impact measure because the first AI that does something here, we have AI, and now we announce to the world, this goes exciting, it goes uh, to the press and stuff like that. Anything that this low impact AI will do will feed a huge a frenzy, so the low impact goes out the window completely. But what you can describe is almost no impact, where the AI behaves as if it isn't turned on. Okay, so this is, I now have a measure of almost no impact. Yay? Well, it turns out you can cheat. Um, this is my sort of example of how you cheat. You have two AIs aiming a laser at an asteroid that's coming towards the Earth. This is high impact, definitely high impact. But if each AI is only doing part of the aiming process, and it assumes, it says have a low impact on the assumption that the other AI is not doing anything. That it can do its part of the job, the other AI can do its part of the job, because this is low impact if the other AI isn't there. And then together, they can aim it correctly and have high impact. Um, there's a variety, of, this doesn't work, by the way, if the robots can see each other. Um, but there is a, there's a variety of tools you can use that. So, low impact failed, but almost no impact plus cheating to get impact uh, actually seems to have succeeded. Then there's oracles, which are really cool. Um, you can, there's various ways of getting information out of an oracle without it manipulating you. Uh, you'll have to read the paper, there are equations. Um, various, oh, okay, I will just go to show one thing here, and then this will probably be the last point. Um, if you ask an oracle to rank, this is the oracle design, the non counterfactual oracle design, that is limited by only answering a small number of questions. You can actually use this with great flexibility. Suppose you could say, which is the AI safety system that is going to make the most progress in the coming year? And it says MIRI, and then it gets rewarded at the end of the year. This will not work. How do we reward it? What is our expectation of the reward? A much better thing is, suppose we give it a mix a uh, list of a million um, projects. This is, what, uh, 18, 20 bits of information? The AI can almost certainly not manipulate us with 20 bits of information. But you do a list, 
of that, you say, pick one of these, and we'll, we also pick 10 others at random. And we run all 11 of these projects. And at the end of the years, we just do our subjective impression as to which one performed better. And now, this is a well-defined task for the AI, which is to choose a project that will be better than a randomly chosen one in our subjective estimation. So we can even use oracles in subtle ways to do AI research, not all AI research. This is where you have to be aware of all the flowing of optimization power and get this, this can be done safely, but something close to this cannot be done safely. Okay, uh, there's more pretty pictures. There's, uh, this is basically the argument that humans do not have values. Um, it's a very interesting and subtle argument and um, I'm going to be presenting it in a few days' time in full. Um, okay, but this is the conclusions. So the problem is the AI sees human as the environment, safe AI value, and they're right, this is correct, that's the problem. Uh, the AI safe AI is very hard to find, AI is going to become powerful. There are methods to improve this, and they apply to specific situations and problems, and you have to really feel out how they work there. Okay? Uh, that's the end of it. Thank you, Stuart. So, some questions in these last few minutes for today. Where are you presenting in a few days' time? <laughs> um, where am I presenting in a few days' time? Uh, it should be over a seminar room in a building in next, nearby. In a seminar room in a building nearby. Yeah. <laughs> it is a mathematician's answer. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure the most popular question I can pose right in front of dinner is specifically one uh, about computational complexity, which we have the class on the, um, on the slide. Uh, and let's see where we sort of part way. I agree with you that computational complexity has very little to say about the unbroken difficulty of the problems of narrow AI. Mm -hmm. And the top of the answer to these, even if the questions in there are actually in the heart, are pretty good in comparison to human But, and this is what I want to try, do you hold that view even about questions that are about computation? Which would be the questions you need to solve in order to have self improving code? That's what let me phrase it differently, a, like a reasonable pathway to superintelligence would be uh, machines that, that perform such improvement by solving very, very hard questions about computation and, and, and become better at that. But here my intuition is that these are exactly the kind of questions where computational complexity actually is right. It may be wrong, I say that as a computational complexity it is, but, but Self-progressive questions, especially about computation, in terms of the bias paradox, really in complicated circumstances, are exactly the thing where computational complexity predicts that this should be hard, it turns out to be hard, and the approximation algorithms are just as useless as all other kinds of algorithms. That may be the case. Uh, you may be right. Uh, I'm not sure that you're right. I would not put more than 70% probability of you being right, um, which is enough for me to worry about it. And the other thing is, in my example of the hacker AI that copies itself everywhere, you don't necessarily need to do any self-improvement to become superpowered. Okay, more questions, quickly. Feed me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if 20 bits of information is safe, then how many bits of information is not safe? This is a big unknown. How vulnerable are humans to social hacking and under what circumstances? Well, I mean, there's, there's, one, there's one example where one bit of information is unsafe. is If I run this super intelligence without any restrictions, will it make me rich and powerful? Yes. Oh, good. That is, in many circumstances, an unsafe one bit of information. But generally speaking, to manipulate someone, especially without a conversation, because the key bit of the oracles is that they reset, so there's no conversation. So without a conversation, 
Um, we, do, we don't know how vulnerable we are to social manipulation. This is why we have to sort of estimate how vulnerable different people and different setups are. But it seems reasonable that there is, uh, so what's 20 bits of information in terms of letters? Um, so, 20 bits, so that's just a few letters. So. Three characters? Sir? Three characters. I am fairly confident that there are no three characters that I can see that would cause me to unbox an oracle just upon seeing them. I challenge. So, <laughs> so there, is, there is a great unknown here. Uh, but there does seem to be uh, at least some arguments that the bats at the third level should be safe. And if there is a three-code, three-letter thing that would cause me to unbox an oracle, we have fundamentally more problems than we assumed. What was that about expecting full predictions? Tell a little bit about why humans might not have values. Um, are you here in a few days' time? Oh, what did you? Um, <laughs> not in five minutes, no. Um, we can talk afterwards. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, it, it, it's a good question. Because it's a very interesting paper. It's maybe one of the most important papers. <sighs> so, has a guess? It might be that. Um, but we believe we're acting for values when we're actually acting for Okay, um, and then you might want to take that off, but I think I heard this. It is more than five minutes. Okay, we'll do this. An AI does an intervention on a human, and as a result, the human does something differently, or seems to have different preferences. In some cases, this is trivial. Um, the AI gives us a left shoe, we take the right shoe. If it gives us the right shoe, we take the left shoe. It has not changed our preferences. This is perfectly fine. We go to brain surgery or heroin injection. The AI does a brain surgery on us. Is this changing our values or is this fulfilling our values? If you model us as a perfectly rational agent, this is fulfilling our values. If you model us as, well, us properly, this is um, changing our values, except we cannot define this by pure observation of humans. It's the is of problem in computer science translated into how do you reward the AI for choosing the right values in its interpretation of what humans do. Um, and we'll talk about that more. That's the really summarized version. Uh, you have well, I was question. just going to follow up. And you, you touched, I mean, I need to come to your next session. <laughs> I mean, exactly. You know, we're all on the same wave. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Okay.